Hello and welcome to Made in the Shade. My name is Brenda Sanders and I'm with the OSU Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture in Stillwater. And today we're going to talk about uh, shady areas in the landscape and specifically alternatives to trying to grow turf grass in those areas. Now this talk is actually part of a series of talks made available by the City of Edmonds Water Resources Conservation University in cooperation with OSU Extension's Think Water program. And before we get started, I wanted to just show you um, some of the other classes that are available that have been recorded. And you probably know how to get there because you're actually listening to this class, but I wanted to show you specifically a class that would go uh, hand in hand with the class that you're going to listen to today and that is underneath classes down here dealing with difficult shady areas i would highly recommend listening to that if you haven't already and uh, specifically if you are trying to grow turf grass in a shaded area and you're running into some problems you may find the answers to your questions on the that talk and also some other good uh, shade uh, area information that we aren't going to cover today. So again, I would highly recommend listening to that talk if you haven't already. So as we start, when uh, might it be time to try other options besides turf grass for your shady areas? And there are several different reasons. One might be you've tried cool season grasses and you've had limited success. Um, as we move out of uh, areas where Bermuda is basically takes full sun, as you move into shade, you have to kind of go to cool season grasses uh, in shady areas. And after a while, uh, that may be hard to do. Uh, you may be seeking lower maintenance. Again, Sometimes it's hard to grow those cool season grasses. They need to be reseeded more often. They also can have disease problems because of uh, the lack of air circulation that often accompanies uh, places that are shadier. You may just be wanting a new look and feel to your landscape. Um, maybe you don't need a large turf area uh, for kids and dogs to play in anymore. Maybe you want to have some more smaller areas in your guard, um, in your landscape. And so that's a good reason. And then maybe you just have more shade. Those trees that you planted that were very small um, have grown for 20 years and now they shade most of your yard. All of these are, are reasons that you might want to try other options beside turf grasses in uh, your landscape. And before we get started, uh, it's, it's good to step back and kind of do a diagnosis on the area um, that you might be seeing uh, problems with your turf grasses. And this is basically a classic example here. Um, you can see we have several trees that are growing fairly close together. And then you can also see an outline here where the Bermuda grass is not growing. And um, just a second, I went too fast. And anyway, we can make an outline here. And basically, this area is not growing grass. And you may even have tried reseeding and watering extra and fertilizing extra, and it's not growing. And the reason is that there is not enough light here to grow Bermuda grass. There's also another problem here in that you can see here on the surface we have several tree roots and this is also a uh, very common problem is that there's so much competition for the water and the nutrients between the tree roots and the the grass that you just have a hard time getting grass to grow. And so even if you move to cool season grasses, you're gonna still have that competition between the tree roots 
and the grasses for the nutrition in the water. So it might be time to change um, from growing turf grasses to something else. And the other thing that we need to think about is that shade is, is really more complicated than just having shade or not having shade. There are actually shades of shade. And um, the first kind of level of shade would be full shade. And that's generally speaking about zero to four hours of direct sun a day. Um, uh, this can happen because of structures. That's very common, especially the north side of structures. If they're very tall um, or very long, um, this area here on the left, that is not going to get any direct sunlight at all. Um, and so this would be a full shade area. And uh, this happens not only in large structures, but also in like a home situation where you might have a fence or a shed um, or even the house next to you that's very close. This area in between the two houses, if it's on the north side, is again not going to get very much sunlight at all on that north uh, side of that house. And so this is another place where you would have full shade. And you can also see here that we've got some, some uh, moss growing. So uh, that's also another indicator that uh, not only are we having shade, but we have a, an area here that gets more water than maybe the rest of the landscape does. So that's also something to keep in mind as you're looking at your shady areas and diagnosing, do I have shade or not? Also take into account um, the soil moisture and also uh, what type of soil you have and things like that. Another way that you can have full shade is from tree cover. And here we have basically uh, a forest type situation. We've got a whole lot of leaf canopy cover from our larger trees. Um, and we just have a very tiny bit of sunlight peeking through the upper canopy of the, the trees. So not much gets to the for the basically the forest floor. Now you can move from full shade to partial shade, which would be about four to six hours of direct sun a day. And a lot of times what you have in shady situations in both full and partial shade is dappled. You have dappled sunlight. And that's what I was talking about before, the, the little bit of sunlight that comes in. And here on the left, you can see just very slight bits of sunlight coming through. This would be a full shade situation. Whereas over here on the right, we have a lot more sunlight coming through. And so that would be a partial shade situation. And if you're trying to figure out, you've got tree canopy cover, and you're trying to figure out, do I have full shade or do I have partial shade? A really easy thing that you can do is go out and take a picture of the, the basically the forest floor or you know your landscape, the lawn. Take a picture several times during the day on, of course, a sunny day, uh, make sure you've got a full sun day. And you can see, if you look at those over time, over the course of a day, you can see what the difference is. And you can probably tell whether you've got more of a full shade situation or a partial shade situation. And that's good to know when you're picking out plant materials and um, trying to deal with what to plant. Uh, the other thing that you may deal with is that you have deciduous trees that lose their leaves over the winter, and you may move from a pretty sunny area over the winter and into the early spring to almost full shade area during the middle of the summer. And so you also need to take that into consideration. So these are just some things to look at when you're trying to decide what type of shade you have. 
one of the other things that you can have with partial shade is the time of day that you get your shade is very important. And it's actually the time of day that you get your sun. If you have morning sun here on the left, you can grow something like an azalea versus a place where you get the same amount of sun, but only in the afternoon. If it's at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to grow azaleas there because they'll burn up. But if you have something like a flowering quince, which is a great um, alternative to planting something like azaleas for several reasons. One, they'll take the sun more, and two, they also are better equipped to withstand drought. And um, that's a great plant to choose if you have that uh, less water and afternoon sun situation. Flowering quince is a good plant to get the same spring bloom wow factor, um, but have a plant that will live. And the other thing that you might see is you might see uh, something uh, when you're looking for plants and it might say partial shade, or you might see some that say partial sun, and you might say, well, what's the difference? And a lot of times they're used somewhat interchangeably, but if something says it needs partial shade, more than likely, it's more like the azalea where the sunlight that it does get is going to need to be in the morning. Whereas if it says partial sun, the sunlight that it does get can be in the afternoon and it's not going to burn up if it gets that west sun. So now that we've talked about the different types of shade there, is available, then we, we want to talk about what are our alternatives to using a turf grass in an area. And to start out with, one of the easiest ways to deal with this is just to add a mulch to the area where your grass is not growing well. And here in both of these situations, you can see they've just basically put mulch in around basically the drip line or where the branches shade the grass. And over here on the right, they've done the same thing here. And this on the right, you can see where we basically got a very classic situation where they started out and these trees were probably very small to begin with. You've got your landscaping along the house and then they had trees and they probably had grass that went clear up to that landscaping. But now the trees are large, they shade out the grass. So they've come in and added mulch to that area. And this, this is a very good thing to do. Now it's, it's usually best to use an organic mulch, meaning a mulch that's made out of uh, plant materials, organic, like uh, shredded bark, um, wood chippings, you can also use shredded uh, leaves, anything like that you can use as your mulch. And it, it actually has several benefits. One, it is an insulation layer. It can keep that soil underneath cooler. It can also keep the water from evaporating as quickly because it won't be as warm. And that helps the basically conserve moisture in the soil. And your organic mulches also really help with the, the soil, uh, the physical soil structure, and also the fertility. As those break down, they add organic matter to the soil, and it just makes a better environment for uh, not only the trees, but anything else that you would plant in that area. It just really helps. And also, adding mulch will help prevent erosion. Um, it helps prevent water runoff which therefore helps prevent erosion. It allows that water when it hits either from rain or from irrigation to soak down into the soil instead of running off and carrying all your soil with it down the street. Uh, about three to four inches of mulch is really all you need. More than that, and you run in the risk of uh, injuring your trees because you'll start suffocating their roots. So a three to four inch 
deep mulch is good. And you want to be sure that you don't pile that up around the trunk of your trees. That's, that's very bad. A lot of times you'll see this with new tree plantings. You'll see what uh, we like to refer to as a mulch volcano. It's mounded up around. That's very bad uh, for the trees for several reasons. One is it keeps it moist there. It can, can encourage diseases to start. And also it can actually uh, serve as a, a shelter for rodents during the winter and they'll burrow in and they will eat the bark of the tree all during the winter and could end up girdling that tree and killing it uh, because it's eaten the bark off all the way around and so you don't want to have that mound you want to kind of bevel that mulch out so that it doesn't go up against the trunk of the tree but just basically kind of slopes down to the base of the tree right right you don't have to slope it a long ways away you know it's like you don't have to slope it where you're stopping the mulch before you get to the trunk but it's just kind of level it down so that it, it meets the trunk at at the base of the trunk basically and not mounted up on the side so once you've put mulch down if you don't want to do anything else you can do some things that can really dress it up you can add some some uh, architectural interest pieces to it. You could use boulders. Um, you could do something like here on the left where you stacked boulders in uh, some basically uh, rebar boxes. Um, you can use statues, also things like bird baths and um, even benches and things like that uh, really go a long ways to dress up a, a mulched area uh, without really adding anything that you would have to take care of. Um, another way to dress up that mulched area is to bring in large pots and grow uh, some seasonal color or seasonal interest annuals in them. Uh, here we have a culvert that's been used as a pot. And then also just bringing several pots in and putting impatiens in them or something like that. And this, um, actually serves several purposes. One, it it's kind of like moving the furniture around in your house. It's easy to do. You can you can switch it up every single year um, or even a couple times in the season, something different for the fall if you wanted to. And the other thing it does is those plants don't have to compete with the tree roots for any um, nutrients or water. And that can really help um, be able to grow something underneath trees where you have a lot of root competition. Now another thing that you can use in shady areas are hardscapes, which are basically things like paths, uh, patios, you can use uh, pergolas, any kind of structure that you might build. Some uh, They're not plant materials, they're hardscapes. And uh, this is a really good way to deal with shady areas that you that might be high traffic areas. Put a path in, or even here on the right, uh, this is a very high traffic area. They've just gone ahead and put a patio in, um, in the most high traffic area, and then even put a pergola over the top to maybe even add a little bit more shade. And these are great ways to deal um, with specific problems in shady areas. One of the third things that you can do as an alternative to growing grass underneath trees or in other shady areas you might find is to use plants and make plantings um, in these areas of plants that actually do like more shade. Uh, than a turf grass would. And this is a great way to really add some interest to a shady area. But what you'll usually find is you add mulch plus hardscape plus plantings all together uh, to make areas in the shade both visually pleasing and also uh, very useful. Um, you can use these areas uh, for pathways, patios, uh, 
it's just a nice way to, to utilize that shady space. This is another example where they've used basically all three of these um, in an area where we've got some hardscape, we've got a path, we've got mulch, there's some plants that have been planted in the ground, and we've even brought in uh, some of the annuals. And these look like they're probably some house plants. They get to go live outside in the shade during the summer. And this is a great way to uh, use some of your shady spaces. Another thing that we might run into on the north side of the building, again, we've got a fountain as our hardscape. We've used mulch in this area and then we've used plantings. And I wanted to point out, this is actually the same area and the picture was, these two pictures were taken two weeks apart. And I wanted to point out what a difference um, your plant material can make if you kind of stagger the season of interest. And we'll talk more about this later. But here, our plant material isn't really the star of the show. And this would have been uh, towards the end of winter. It's very, very, very early spring. So this is basically what it's looked like throughout the winter. And it's not boring because we've got our hardscape in there. But then as we come into spring over on the right, you see how it just, it really does come alive um, with all of the other plant materials. So you can have a different look varying um, the different elements that you use. And uh, one more instance here, when I talked about earlier where you have two houses, close together, a lot of times that area is really a pretty high traffic area. You know, it's your access to your backyard, your garage, all of those things. You can put a path through there and then put plantings on either side and you'll probably have better results than if you kept trying to grow a cool season grass in this area where it had that high traffic on it, which Cool season grasses already are at a disadvantage uh, because of our uh, warm climate, but they also, if you have high traffic on them, you're, you're compacting that soil and it's, it's another strike against having success. So if you can put a path in, you're kind of alleviating some of that problem. And then over here on the right, they've basically decided that they didn't want turf in their yard and probably because as you can see they have a lot of shade and probably this area here is also uh, very hard to get water to and so we've gone in with a lot of mulch and plants that can take uh, more of a, a low water situation and it really ends up looking very nice so Basically, we've covered uh, a lot of the different alternatives that you can use. Uh, so I wanted to kind of expound on when you want to use plants, some of the things that you need to look for. And I'm, I'm bringing up the forest picture again because I wanted to just kind of take a look because when you are planting, uh, you're basically in a shady area, you're kind of recreating, uh, you're wanting to use plants that like the shade. So basically think forest plants. And if we look at this, you can see that we have some smaller trees. These would be called understory trees. We also have some shrubs, a little bit lower, and then we have some perennial type plants and then over here we even have what would be called ground cover. So we basically have tiers of plants in here. Now if we go take a look at basically a recreation of a forest area in, in our landscape, we look through here, we basically See, we've got an understory tree, then we've got some shrubs, 
we have some perennials and then we have some ground cover. So we basically have those same elements, but what has happened is that we've also paid attention to leaf color. Also, we've paid attention to leaf texture and we have blooms and different elements that make this much more interesting than just our green that we had in our forest situation. And so with a little bit of, of uh, planning and uh, proper plant selection, you can really make a very, very nice, uh, relaxing area in your landscape using plants. Another thing that you want to take, just pay attention to when you're choosing your plants is the season of interest. You don't want everything that you choose to have a bloom in the spring and then no interest the rest of the year. So choose plant material that you have interest when you get everything planted in all the seasons. And I just want to show you an example of this. Here we have on the left uh, we're just coming out of winter and we have some of our evergreen shrubs here. You can just see some of the perennials starting to come up. We have a large mulched area. Now over on the other side of this, this is the same bed, this is just the other side, you see a very large section of mondo grass here or ground cover that is evergreen and that's basically been there all winter and it looks very nice it's very lush but if you just had this grass there the whole season and you didn't have anything else you would miss out on here on the right hand side this is a perennial garden later in the summer and look how beautiful it is and if you have left this space here then you have space for that to come up here. That's what this is gonna look like uh, later in the season. So basically you wanna kind of stagger your season of interest. And here we have another really nice area. We've got a lot of nice ground cover. We've also used some of our annual flowers up here in front for some seasonal color. Now it seems like this is actually gonna it seems like a lot of trouble. Um, and you think, well, it would have been easier if I would have just put grass seed out and I would have watered it. And uh, it just seems like a lot of work. And is it really worth it? Well, yes, it is. It is definitely worth it. And there are several advantages to shade and also to utilizing other plant material in the shade. And one is it's very inviting and refreshing. And shade can be up to 20 degrees cooler than it is out in full sun. And you know, in Oklahoma, we definitely know the value of a shady spot. Um, also, plants in the shade will uh, lose less water because we're getting less evaporation from the sun. And there's many options, um, both in what you can plant and also what design that you can use in the shade and it is a lot of work at the beginning trying to choose the plants um, that work best but if you if you spend the time at the beginning the reward of lower maintenance later really pays off and not only a reward of lower maintenance but also um, it can help you uh, save on water use if you choose your plant materials correctly. So uh, now I'm basically going to go over uh, some of the plant materials that work very well uh, for us in shady areas and also that tend to use less water than some of the others. And that's why I'm not going to be talking about azaleas and I'm not going to be talking about uh, hostas today. Um, I'm going to point out some of the other plant materials that do better with maybe drier situations. 
And we're going to do this um, basically by those tiers. We're going to start out with some of the, the trees. And when I talk about trees, I'm talking about, again, your, your understory trees, the smaller trees that you find growing around the edges of larger trees in the forest. And our classic example of that is um, the red bud. You know, it's native to Oklahoma and it packs a punch in the spring. You can drive uh, between here and Tulsa especially and you see all of the red buds. That's the first thing you see in the spring. And it's a wonderful tree uh, for uh, a shady landscape in in Oklahoma because of its ad adaptation to our area and also because it's just beautiful in the spring. And that pretty much is is its season of interest. Now there are some cultivars. Uh, forest pansy has purple leaves and so that gives it some interest through the summer um, and into the fall because of its purple leaves. So you can find some with a longer season of interest. Another great tree is the fringe tree. And um, this actually, I think, needs to be used more in our landscapes than it is. It's a nice, it's a smaller tree. It's only about 15 to 20 feet tall. And it has this beautiful white bloom. And it's a really good substitute for. Uh, the Bradford pear. We're trying to uh, n stop planting Bradford pear. They've become a weed tree. They they grow all over the place and not they're not very well suited for our environment because they tend to split out in ice storms and they also don't smell very good when they bloom. And so this is a nice spring blooming white flower tree. Um, that also has some good fall color to it. It's usually kind of a, a yellow color. And uh, it's, it's a really good uh, tough tree that uh, can grow in partial shade. Another good tree is the winterberry euonymus. And it is very, very tough. It's drought tolerant. It gets about 15 to 20 feet tall. And it actually, is a, it can be a shrub, but it can also be limbed up. You can trim it up and keep it trimmed uh, so that you can have it be a small tree. And it has really nice, kind of a, a almost lacy look to it. The, the leaves are small. They're, they're just about a two inch uh, leaf and it has good fall color. It's, it's yellow. It's, kind of pretty and then it also gets these beautiful berries in the fall and into the winter um, that are gorgeous and the birds love them which uh, for that reason the berries will not be there all winter long but you will have a good uh, selection of birds to watch if you plant this tree because they like the berries and one of our uh, final trees that I really like. It's it's a little pickier than the others, but if you side it in the right place, it it does very well in in a partially shaded area. The paper bark maple needs to be protected from our hot drying winds, but the partial shade is the perfect place to plant it where it's correct. It can be uh, protected. It actually gets taller. It gets about twenty to 30 feet tall, but it grows very, very slowly. So um, it also tolerates clay soils and it can tolerate a little bit of drought. Um, it's really those hot winds that it doesn't like. So if you plant it in a, in a protected area, it does better. And it has a darker leaf than most maples. It's really pretty and coupled with the bark that you can can see down here on the bottom. The bark really is that dark, rich, chocolatey brown color. And that's what gives it such a beautiful uh, winter interest um, when it doesn't have leaves is this bark. And it also has a uh, good fall color. So it's another one of the trees that really gives you some, 
some year-round uh, interest. Moving on to our next tier, um, we'll take a look at sh several shrubs that do very well for us in the shade. And the first one is flowering quince. Now flowering quince can actually take full sun, but it also uh, does, does well in partial shade. And its basic, its season of interest is spring. You get a bang, you get a lot of bang for your buck with a flowering quince in the spring because it's gorgeous and it's tough. It's, it's a fairly, it can get to be a fairly large shrub, six to 10 feet more. It gets uh, wider than it does tall. Now you can actually keep it narrower if you come down here and actually trim at the base, trim these out, and you can uh, keep it more contained that way. Remove those suckers at ground level if you don't want it to spread. Um, and it is, once it's established, it's, it's a drought tolerant shrub. Another very early blooming shrub is, is a Japanese caryat. And this has a yellow flower and it's gorgeous. And again, it's very early. It, it blooms just a little after the flowering quince, uh, say about mid-March. Another neat thing about the caria is that it has green stems. And so even when it doesn't have leaves on it, it has winter interest. So its season of interest is basically the winter through the spring. And then it kind of becomes a background shrub. Korean spice viburnum is another uh, early spring bloomer. Uh, basically, probably about the same time, that mid-March, mid to the end of March, first part of April is when it's going to bloom. And it has a beautiful scent. If you uh, plant this close to a place where you're going to be sitting outside, uh, you'll really enjoy it. The other thing that's neat about Korean spice is it's a good bee plant because the bees really like these flowers and it's nice to have things that are blooming very early in the spring when not a lot of other uh, things are available for for bees to to uh, forage on so it's a good choice and it also has some nice fall color on its leaves and this next shrub is one of my favorites this is the oak leaf hydrangea and it basically gives you four seasons of interest and there are four different seasons of interest. Um, it actually blooms in the basically May to July-ish time. So it's the late spring, early summer is when you get this nice big white bloom on it. Um, but even before that, uh, when it's starting to leaf out, when it first starts to leaf out, the leaves are almost a silvery color and it's, they're very pretty. And then they uh, go ahead and expand and they're this nice big, they look like oak leaves. It's the same shape as an oak leaf, which is where it gets its name. But they're a very big green leaf that's just beautiful. Then in the fall, it has the leaves have a, a really nice uh, kind of reddishy bronze color to them. And then after it drops its leaves, um, the stalks on it are kind of a peely bark. And then the, the flowers, the dried flower uh, heads on there uh, look pretty throughout the winter. So it really is a great plant for uh, all season interest, basically. Now the nine bark is a very, very tough shrub. It's tolerant of drought and it flowers in the later spring. And the neat thing about it is it, it kind of has this purplish leaf to it. And you can get cultivars that have even a, a deeper purple leaf to them. And um, it's, it's nice as an alternative to the green leaves that you see during the rest of the summer, you have more of a purple leaf to it and it gets a nice fall color as well. The, the glossy abelia is a nice 
shrub because it actually has interest from summer, fall into winter because it's what we call a semi evergreen in that some years it will basically keep its leaves all winter. Now there are other years that it will drop leaves if it gets really cold, but don't worry, it the the shrub isn't dead, it will go ahead and relief in the spring. The other thing that's nice is it has, uh, it basically starts blooming and it blooms continually from, from late spring on through the fall. And so it's a good uh, insect, uh, you know, it's good for pollinators because it has those blooms and they're not as showy as some of those earlier spring blooming shrubs but but they are still pretty and the whole shrub itself is is a is really it almost has that nice kind of light airy look to it and it's very pretty you can also get uh cultivars of this shrub that have variegated leaves and so you get interest from the leaf color as well as from the bloom so it's it's a nice shrub to have and it's it's also a very very tough shrub Moving on to uh, some of uh, larger shrubs, this southern wax myrtle actually gets 10 to 15 feet tall, and it, it could actually be used as a small tree. If you want to do like we did with the, the um, winterberry euonymus, you can, you can limit up, cut off those lower branches, expose the, the trunks of um, basically have a multi-trunk type tree and that's a nice a nice addition to the landscape the other thing is is that its leaf color um, is really good in the summer and then also during the winter because it is an evergreen shrub and it's more of an olive green and so that also sets it apart from some of the other shrubs that have more of the uh, the darker green uh, color to them. And this is also um, one of my favorites, um, not only because of the the bright purple berries, but also because the time of year that it ha it it really sh puts on a show at a time of year when a lot of the other shrubs are uh, not doing much. Either they're dormant or they're just kind of sitting there. And the beauty berry has sets these beautiful purple berries on them in the fall and they persist through the winter. And again, great bird food. And the birds love this shrub. Um, it can get uh, five to six feet tall and probably that wide or wider. It tends to be a little bit wider than it is tall. And I would suggest, um, it's kind of like the forsythia in that you wanna have it you don't want to have to do a lot of trimming to it. It's nice if you can leave those long arching stems because as you can see, they're lined with the purple berries. And if you can, the longer the stem is, the more of those berries are gonna, gonna show. And so it's really, really pretty. It actually blooms. Um, it blooms after the leaves come out. So you can't really tell if the, the bloom is not the show it's the berry that's the show with this this shrub and our final our final shrub is the grape hollies um, or mahonia species and there's several different types this one is just the standard this is the oregon grape holly and the reason that they're called hollies they're actually not hollies they're in the barberry family but the leaves look like holly leaves you know it's that same shape and with the little points on the ends and also the grape part is that the fruits actually look like grapes um, it has uh, it blooms in the spring with a it actually blooms fairly early spring and it has a, a yellow flower which is really quite pretty but um i think that the the best use for this it really is a all season shrub and it is especially important in the winter because it looks nice with those nice dark shiny leaves when there's not a lot of other plants around so 
it's it's a good addition and the other thing that's neat about this is it takes this is one of the shrubs that actually takes that full shade it takes a lot of shade and it does fine and that's that's important because some of the other other more uh brightly flowering shrubs that we have need a little bit more sun to get those flowers but this one does great in full shade moving on to our perennials and i like to think of these as kind of their they kind of help dress up um, our landscape because a lot of them we're growing them for either a lot of flowers or also um, kind of uh, highlighting the leaves or the textures of the leaves but the lenten rose is is a great perennial because it it is basically the first thing to bloom in the landscape basically middle of february to uh, the first part of march is when lenten roses bloom and they also have uh, an evergreen leaf to them so they're they're there most of the year now the summer and the fall those leaves will be kind of scorchy looking and they really won't they won't stand out but for winter and into early spring this is definitely something to plant in your landscape creeping phlox is also another early spring bloomer not as not as early as lenten lenten rose they basically are blooming mid-march uh, to the end of march first part of april um, really Anywhere from mid-March to mid-April is when creeping phlox is going to be blooming, depending on the year. And this is not to be confused with moss phlox, which moss phlox is the, the phlox that has a similar, it has a similar looking flower. That's hard to say. Um, but it the foliage on the moss phlox is that piney looking foliage. And this has a, a leaf and it actually grows very close to the ground and then just sends up these flower stalks and after it blooms you basically just see matted full it kind of retreats into the background it has its show and then it retreats and that makes it a very well behaved garden plant because it knows when it's supposed to shine and then it knows when it's supposed to step back so it's good to have and i'm going to talk about pairing this with one of the ground covers later if you like this color of blue it's it's a wonderful thing to have in your landscape another of what they call the spring ephemerals uh, those are basically those flowers that bloom first thing in the spring when the trees don't have leaves yet while they still get some light this is one of them the bird's foot viola is actually a native to our state and that makes it a good choice because uh, it's not going to need a whole lot of extra care. And it's a very pretty uh, flower that will kind of slowly spread. Coral bells is uh, kind of a workhorse of the shade garden because not only does it have a pretty bloom, but it also has great leaf color. Both of these plants here in this picture are coral bells. And uh, look at the difference in, in the different varieties of leaf color and that's an important thing to have and especially as you move from partial shade into your full shade deep shade um, you need to rely more on leaf color for interest than you do on flowers um, for two reasons one your flowers don't stay very they don't stay around very long in the deep shade and they may not even bloom but also leaf color is more uh, pronounced in the deep shade and it's going to stay longer than a flower would and your coral bells basically give spring summer and fall interest and sometimes even through winter um, you'll uh, they'll be kind of semi evergreen and so they really have a long season of interest and they're more uh, tolerant of drier situations than say something like a hosta um, so that also makes them good in in a shade garden where we're trying to conserve water 
Let's see if I can get it to. There we go. The eastern red columbine, usually we think of columbines as maybe being from more of a mountainous area, but this is actually native to our state. And it has a great uh, bloom on it that hummingbirds love. If you like hummingbirds, you need to plant this in your garden. It blooms April to May, so it's basic spring into summer is its time of interest. The Once it's done blooming, the leaves on it are also so pretty. It's kind of a lacy look that can add that texture to your garden. Now I'm going to show you a few of the plants that were growing not for bloom, but for their leaves. And these would be uh, some of the ferns. And these are ferns that actually can take drier conditions. And Japanese painted fern is not native to our state, but it is a good fern choice for our state because it does take drier conditions. And it's also great because it has this kind of a silvery look to the leaves. And that really helps it stand out in a, you know, a situation where you have not as much light. It can pick up that dappled sunlight that's coming through and just really reflect it back at you. It's very pretty. And uh, again, it takes the deeper shade, um, which is also good. And most of its interest is in the spring into the summer. The hairy lip fern is actually native to Oklahoma, and it likes drier conditions. It likes rocky, uh, kind of well-drained soil, but it is uh, basically something green and ferny looking that can take more of a, a drier situation, which is a nice addition to the garden. And one other fern that is uh, native to our state is the Christmas fern. And it, as its name implies, actually can keep its foliage through a good part of the winter. And that's nice too, to have something green later on into the winter. And that that gives the this fern interest basically uh, year round. The toad lily is, is a neat addition because its bloom, whereas most of these perennials that we talked about, the bloom is in the spring, its bloom is in the su summer into fall. And so it's blooming in the shade at a time when a lot of other things aren't. And it has this really interesting looking uh, flower to it. And uh, it's just kind of a neat thing to come upon um, late in the season. And it takes a little bit more water than some of these others. But again, if you have an area that's maybe by a drain spout or something like that, that's going to take more water and it needs a plant that can go through that, then toad lily would be a good choice for that. The Arkansas blue star is a good uh, perennial for not only its bloom, um, but also look at this fall color. It's got, it's just like electric. It's beautiful, the yellow color that comes. And then the foliage, even if it's not blooming and it's not fall, the nice lacy green foliage brings a really pretty uh, texture to the garden. And our final perennial here is Italian arum. And this is neat because it actually comes up in the fall and stays green through the winter and into the spring. Then the leaves die and you get the flowers and fruits that come up after the leaves have died. And it's a really good uh, plant to pair like with the ferns and things like that. And then you alternate when you have your green leaves in the area. So that's some of the trees, shrubs, and perennials that are available. 
And now we're going to take a look at some of the ground covers that you can use. And uh, ground covers work well because they also help uh, prevent erosion, um, just like the mulch does. And a juga is one that's good because not only does it have a pretty bloom, but it also has a really neat leaf to it. And sometimes the leaves are kind of a bronzy color. You can get different varieties. And its interest, its time of interest is basically the spring and then uh, through the summer. And uh, it will slowly, sp it, it spreads through uh, stone. So it, it will go ahead and form a mat as it uh, basically spreads so it'll cover an area which that's basically all of these plants that i'm talking about now are ground covers so they will cover a larger area than your other perennials will um, the vinca is a great plant for um, it's tough it can take quite a bit of shade it's good to stabilize if you have a slope um, and you want to stabilize it so it doesn't erode uh, vinca is a good workhorse horse for that and it has a pretty bloom in the spring and the way to keep it a little bit uh, trimmed up is just mow it in the spring before it starts to grow um, and that will help it uh, just kind of be better behaved. The vinca also tolerates uh, quite a bit of, of drought so it, it's not very picky. It's it's a good workhorse as far as the um, the ground covers go. This next one, the hardy plumbega, this is my favorite ground cover um, because I like the blue flowers. And this is the one I was talking about. If you pair this with uh, the creeping flocks, then you have blue flowers in the spring, and you also have blue flowers in the later summer because this this will bloom in July to September. And uh, it's, it's just gorgeous. Now this uh, hardy plumbago likes to have that shade in the afternoon. So if it gets the sun, let it be morning sun that it gets and uh, not that late, late afternoon sun. We also have a couple of the ground covers that look more like grass, um, the monkey grass or mondo grass, which is actually its name, although both of these are referred to as monkey grass that I'm going to show you. But mondo grass likes deep shade. It's this dark, dark green color, and you can get regular mondo grass, which gets four to six inches tall, or you can get dwarf mondo grass, which is only three to four inches tall, depending on what you need. And basically, it's going to stay this nice green color year round. Then our other grass, quote unquote, because they're actually in the lily family, that it can be referred to as monkey grass is the liriope. And liriope is a lighter green color. The solid one is a lighter green color than your mondo grass, but it also comes in a variegated form, which is a lot of people like to use it. And it looks a lot like an airplane plant to me. It's not, but it looks a lot like it. And it also has this nice bloom on it, which makes it, it fun to use. And uh, these, again, can help in uh, areas where you need to stabilize uh, the soil. The liriope will take a lot more sun than the mondo grass. Again, if, you're, if you've got that end of the day uh, sun, use the liriope instead of the mondo grass in that area. Now we've covered basically our plants. I just wanted to cover a little bit of what I would call the icing on the cake or maybe even the sprinkles on top uh, that give your shade garden some uh, pops of color. And these are uh, the spring flowering bulbs, uh, things like your crocus, grape hyacinth, daffodils, and tulips. Bulbs are wonderful uh, for shade gardens for two reasons. One, they flower in the spring, and so if you have your deciduous trees, 
they flower and they do their thing before the trees get all their leaves. And the other thing is they flower and do their thing and then they go dormant. And so they don't require a lot of water throughout the summer. In fact, it's better if they don't have water because then you don't, the bulbs don't uh, rot in the ground. So spring flowering bulbs are a wonderful way to add a lot of pizzazz to your shade garden. Then during the summer, you can use annuals in smaller places uh, to add some pops of color. And things like wax begonias, you can also use impatiens. These are great in shady areas. Um, uh, spider flower can actually take partial shade and it's a taller annual that you can use. And something like taurinia is a good way to get a, a blue flowering annual in your shade garden. Now we've covered a lot of things and I just wanted to point out some resources. If you want to go back and look things up. There are several resources that are available and one that's really good for the Edmond area um, is in the water resources webpage, the drought tolerant plant database. You can put in your search criteria and then it will bring up plants that would do well in uh, with whatever criteria you've put in. So this is an excellent resource. Also, um, by the Extension Service, the Water Efficient Landscapes for Oklahoma is a booklet that's been put out that gives you tips on um, how to have a more water efficient landscape and also plant selections for those areas. Another good place to find plants uh, that are good for Oklahoma is with the Oklahoma Proven. There's a website and they also have a booklet that's put out. Um, for the last, uh, last year was their 20th year and every year they come out with plants that have been proven to do well in our state. Also um, on the OSU uh, Extension website, you can look under the uh, Think Water um, portion of that website and uh, find some good resources for uh, water conservation. And of course, your Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Office in Oklahoma County is a great place uh, for all sorts of extension information. And just as a refresher, in case you don't know or don't remember uh, what OSU Cooperative Extension is and what we do, we basically uh, bring the university to communities large and small statewide. And that's why there is an extension office in every county in Oklahoma. And the educators and specialists develop science-based educational programs to help Oklahomans solve local issues, concerns, promote leadership, and manage resources wisely. And you can check out their website at oces.oakstate.edu. And finally, I wanted to just again mention that the Oklahoma County Cooperative Extension Office is on 2500 Northeast 63rd Street in Oklahoma City. And if you, got, if you have questions, you can call this number or you can also uh, send them an email. And so if you have questions about this presentation or any of the others, feel free to give us a call and uh, ask us those questions. We're here to help you. And if you could help us, uh, please, uh, there'll be a survey underneath uh, this video. If you could click on that and uh, fill it out for us, it really helps us a lot uh, because it helps us know how we can serve you better. And again, um, thank you for listening and uh, happy gardening.